I'm really happy to be here today and have the opportunity to talk about um, some research and a place that's become dear to my heart in the past, uh, over the course of the past several years. And um, today I'm mostly going to talk about um, talk about what we know so far from our work in the Upper Gila and particularly in Mule Creek um, from our past three seasons of work. I'm um, going to talk about what we know about what was, what was going on in that area. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the future, but probably not too much. But I, um, Bill made a nice introduction to the field school, and um, I'm happy to answer a lot more, more questions about that if you all have questions at the end. So who or what or when or why uh, is Salado? Um, this has been the topic of decades of debate amongst archaeologists and amongst many of us at the center around the conference room table. Um, and it's one of the main issues driving research at the Center for Desert Archaeology. Um, when I joined the center in 2007, my colleagues had already invested a lot of effort into trying to answer that question um, with work in uh, southeastern Arizona, particularly the San Pedro Valley. And one thing that came out of that research is that to us, Salado describes both people and a process of cultural change. So it's a, a process of adopting a shared identity. Um, it has distinctive material culture har hallmarks, one of which is probably the best known of which is Salado polychrome pottery, an example of what you see there. In the 14th century Southwest in southeastern Arizona and southwestern New Mexico, uh, populations from multiple cultural backgrounds came together, they aggregated into large villages. We talk about these as coalescent communities. Um, they were integrated by an inclusive ideology uh, ex expressed on Salado polychrome pottery. <clears throat> so this map just gives you a sense of where some of the large known uh, Salado sites are in the southern southwest. Then beginning in 2008, we turned our attention to one area where Salado groups settled, the Upper Gila and its tributaries, and the Members Valley of southwestern New Mexico. <clears throat> and there were several things that initially drew us to this area. Oops. Point at the projector. <clears throat> there we go. Didn't want to miss that slide. Um, so there was evidence for the president, presence of migrant groups from the Cayenta and Tucson areas in northeastern Arizona that established enclaves at several sites in the upper Gila region. And we can identify these by the presence of things like perforated plates, Maverick Mountain series pottery, uh, certain kinds of architecture, um, Kiva styles, and Kiva entry boxes. So we have evidence for um, that the Cayenta migrants and, and Tucson area migrants were coming down into the upper Gila area. <clears throat> we also had evidence later for large population influx and Salado pottery at sites in the Cliff Valley and elsewhere. Oh, well, that's interesting. I didn't know it did that. So, <laughs> okay. So, the other thing that was really intriguing and that drew us to the Upper Gila and Mule Creek in particular was that the Mule Creek Obsidian Source and its, its neighbors, Cow Canyon and others there, were known to be widely distributed in southeastern Arizona in the 1300s. And this is, uh, I think, the most recent iteration of a large project that the Center and um, Barbara Mills of the University of Arizona are collaborating on with, uh, with others as well, where um, we are compiling a database on obsidian sources throughout the southern southwest. And so just to show you all those sites that are mostly red, those are using uh, Mule Creek area obsidian. So just to show you how, how widespread that was. So we were attracted to this area that we knew um, was in close proximity to the source of this, this uh, obsidian. The upper Gila region is not very well understood and hasn't received all that much attention, particularly not much research attention. And there are a few exceptions to this. Um, Bill just talked about the Members Foundation uh, work. They did excavations at um, sites with Salado components in the Members River Valley. There's also um, um, uh, 
Steve Lexon's excavations at sites near the Cliff Valley. Um, there are mills and mills. Frank and Vera Mills um, were avocational archaeologists who excavated at several places. One of them was the Denwoody site, um, and there's a report for that site. Then there's also a large highway salvage excavation at the Ormond Village site, which is shown here. Um, that one was done, I believe, in the 60s, and the parts of the collection were examined and written up in the 90s, but only a small portion of it. <clears throat> so this, I just wanted to show you a little bit of what that site looked like. We're actually, I think that's Bill walking around up here at the Ormond Village site, what it looks like today. Um, this was a map that was made of the site. And this is just an example of some of the Salado um, adobe walls with the, with the footings. <clears throat> so we knew that some work had been done, but there was the potential that a lot more could be done. <clears throat> so just wanted to bring up to speed of sort of what the, we know in general about the cultural history of the, the Upper Gila and um, Mill Creek area. Um, we know that by prior to about 1150, 1130 AD, um, people who lived here were part of the, the members Muggio under the Highland Muggio and tradition. There are lots of classic member sites. <clears throat> and it seems that, or it seemed that, I guess I should say, um, based on all previous work, that there weren't many people living in the area in the 1200s. That after the classic members collapse, folks either we're living in smaller villages, um, hamlets like Peggy Nelson talks about for the Eastern Members area, where they, they weren't these big aggregated sites. People were living in smaller villages. They were moving around a lot. Or they had just gone elsewhere. They, weren't, they were no longer in the region. <clears throat> so about 1150, 1180, things get really complicated and confusing, at least for archaeologists, because there are, um, there are a lot of different terms that are used to describe different cultural traditions and a lot of diversity and a lot of variability in the area. So from about 1180 to 11 to 1300 you get things like the Tularosa phase and the Black Mountain phase further to the south and, and the east. Um, you get the Animus phase that probably has ties to um, northern Mexico and it's not clear how many people we're talking about, um, how large their, their settlements were, how they were organized. Um, but lots of diversity. <clears throat> so starting around 1300 and, and particularly by the late 1300s, we have what's known as the cliff phase. And this is essentially the Salado occupations. It's named for the cliff valley, uh, predictably. And um, it looks like at many sites there's an overlay of a Salado occupation on earlier members, classic member sites. There may be some single component sites as well. Um, there are certainly sites like Ormond Village which have a huge late cliff occupation. It's not clear how, how many people were there at, actually in members' times. <clears throat> so these are the folks that made um, these distinctive late uh, versions of Salado polychrome, like Denwoody polychrome, which is my personal favorite um, right here, and Cliff polychrome, and then Cliff um, white on red. And so you get this diversification of Salado polychrome types, and we know that a lot of these are found at um, these Salado sites in the upper Gila. So these folks don't appear to have stayed for too long in the upper Gila region because early in the 15th century, the 1450 date is sort of um, tenuous. But sometime after that point, they, um, they were gone. And one of the places we think they went uh, was north up to the Zuni region. You have um, places like Hawiku where you have lots of cremation, variable, uh, cremation burials, which is very similar to Salado sites that we know about. You get some of these late um, Salado polychrome types. So it looks like that, that may be one area um, where they went. Okay, so turning now to Mule Creek, and based on what we knew at the time, so 2007, 2008, uh, we postulated that there were Kayenta migrants who moved into this area, a relatively empty frontier, we thought, there weren't many people there, where they could continue their culture and practice their religion, and they were relatively isolated. We thought if Kayenta groups were controlling obsidian, uh, obsidian exchange, which we had evidence from our previous research in the San Pedro in southeastern Arizona, um, we thought we'd find an enclave uh, near 
the obsidian sources, the known obsidian sources in Mill Creek. Um, then we also expected to find a population influx in the 1300s as Salado groups left southeastern Arizona and moved over to, <clears throat> excuse me, to the east. So several seasons of work in, in Mule Creek have confirmed a lot of these ideas, but they've also led us to rethink some of them as well. Um, for one thing, uh, we now have evidence uh, at one of the sites I'm going to talk about today, the Fornholt site, that there was a pretty good big group of people living there in the 1200s, and they were doing things pretty differently than we expected and pretty differently than the, the Cayenta Enclave the migrants were doing. More about that in a minute because I really wanted to touch on this briefly um, because this is right now as we're planning our, our field school effort, this is fresh in my mind. What do we mean by, by preservation archaeology? What are we, what are we doing? Um, and <clears throat> We're guided by the principles of preservation archaeology, which is essentially research within a conservation ethic. So what this means is, is either limiting excavations to threatened sites or focusing ex excavations with, with a limited range of easily answerable questions um, at, uh, <clears throat> at sites. So for example, test units and non-architectural site components, that's one of the things we've been doing quite a bit uh, <clears throat> at Mule Creek. So this, is, this allows us to gather a lot of information with minimal damage to the sites. Um, the second component is studying, studying previously excavated artifacts that um, in the case of many of the upper Gila sites, the, the collections that exist have been woefully understudied and there's a huge wealth of data we can, we can gather just from going back to the original collections. Ormond Village, Village, for example, only a very small portion of that entire assemblage was ever uh, examined in any detail. There are well over 200 boxes probably at the Lab of Anthropology that have never, uh, a, a large portion of them have never been washed. Um, and that's simply because there was no, there was no funding there to, to pay for that analysis. So that's another component too. We always want to make sure that we, we've thought about what's going to happen to the materials that we excavate and that there's a plan for long-term curation and um, paying for that. It's, it's expensive. <clears throat> So we're looking at collections from a number of previously excavated sites, the Mills Collection at Eastern Arizona College. Um, and then also looking at old collections using modern techniques, things like NAA, neutron activation analysis, allows us to source clay used to make, make pottery to predict particular areas. And then we can trace how pottery was produced and exchanged. Um, petrographic analysis, looking at the temper or the inclusions in pottery that potters would add um, would we can also identify particular temper sources so that that complements the NAA and then XRF um, x-ray fluorescence obsidian sourcing um, allowing us to figure out where obsidian um, what source it, it is from and so these are things modern techniques that that we can apply on collections that are, already exist in addition to materials that we have so all of these things are, are built into our research okay so I want to summarize the research we've accomplished so far and what we've learned. <clears throat> and um, as you can see from this slide, the Mule Creek area is a very attractive environment. Um, it's got readily available water. It's got good agricultural land. It's pleasant and, <laughs> and uh, it's a good place to be as, now as in the past. Um, uh, Bill already talked, well actually you didn't talk about Members Foundation work out here, but they actually surveyed this area in the 70s and reported um, the three up site, which is shown here, it's this big, big mound right here. Um, so they made a map of it, they reported on it, and then graduate students from Arizona State University um, also did some test excavations there. And that was actually, as far as I know, our first connection to that area um, was through Karen Schulmeyer, a student at ASU whose uncle happens to own that property. <clears throat> so we did uh, two field schools, two field seasons with Hendricks College and, and Brett Hill as a director. And then last year we had a group of volunteers going out to the Fornholt site, which I'll show you in just a minute, and um, doing some <clears throat> mapping to produce a, a detailed stone-by-stone -stone map um, of what was visible on the surface of the site. Oh, just to show you um, the relationship of the three sites I'm talking about to one another, um, here is Tennessee Creek and Mule Creek, um, Gommelstad I'll talk about in a minute, 
Bornholt, and here's the different um, loci of the three upstate. So just talking a little bit more about the wall clearing we did to produce the Fornholt map. Basically, this is a really um, low impact way to expose walls on sites that are well preserved like the Fornholt site is. And so you just get out with a brush and a trowel and you find a rock and you chase it and find the next rock. And so we spent two weeks doing this with our volunteer uh, crew. Okay. Um, let's see. So what, what I want to do next is, is synthesize or summarize what we know. And I'm going to talk about 3UP and I'm going to talk about Fornholt. And I'm going to unfortunately ignore Gommelstad uh, in this talk. Um, and only because it's a little problematic. We, we don't really have a very good sense of what's, what's going on there, Catherine, shrugging. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we didn't uh, do as many test units there. We didn't, we didn't spend as much time investigating that site. Um, it, it's interesting. Um, but I feel like it would be more productive to compare what we know about the sites for which we have the most data. This is Catherine's lovely map of the 3 up site. Um, and as you can see, hopefully, it's, it spans quite a big area along the creek here. There are several different loci and we think they have different occupational histories. They look different on the surface. Um, they vary in size. Uh, it's really tough to get an overall sense of how the site was laid out. It's had some vandalism in the past. Um, it's quite densely covered with, with grass, depending on what time of year you're out there. Um, and just walking around on the surface, it's, it's really tough to figure out what you're looking at. Um, so ASU did some sampling out there. They did some test units out there. We had a sense of what we might find based on what they found. And our goal was then to put test units into trash middens that we hoped were associated with different components of the site. We had some indications that we might have um, different occupation dates for different of uh, the loci here. Um, and so we had um, variable success with our, our plan. Um, so locus A, which is the top one up here. And this is just kind of a blow, uh, blown up version of that. That map I showed you, the most prominent hill there was Locus A. It really dominates the site. It's the main body of the site. And it's a really big, stratified, deep deposit. It's probably got um, everything from Salado on the top all the way down to pit house period occupations. And even archaic, I believe there's an archaic point found, that ASU found, two archaic points, Rob says. So it's got a long occupation history. Um, so we put some, some test units here. Most of the, the surface, ar surface architecture, the architecture that's visible on the surface is here at Locus A. So there's cobble wall alignments, there's adobe, um, kind of a, a mishmash. Locus B is here. It's another hill. And then we have these little loci around here, which I'm not going to talk much about. Most of our efforts were focused on these three. So Locus B, um, it's got cobble and adobe wall alignments as well. And then Locus C, it's off down by itself here. Um, pretty far, a pretty far walk from the main body of the site, as we learned every day when we had to walk back for lunch. Um, so it's, it's technically part of the same site, but uh, how it was really related, I think, is still an open question. Um, so it's got two small natural hills that has adobe architecture. Um, so in most areas, we were successful in sampling midden deposits. However, we occasionally would run into walls because we didn't know quite where we were. Um, it's hard to tell. And especially over here in Locust Sea, when we, we were hoping we were excavating in a midden, it turns out we were in a really shallow room that was only about 30 centimeters below the surface and had this nice plastered floor with a perforated plate broken on it and also a lot of late um, Salado polychrome types. And I have to confess that I, I missed the finding of the perforated plate. And when I was sent an email, I don't remember who emailed me now, but when I, someone sent me an email and said, we found a perforated plate. And I said, no, you didn't. <laughs> and it's on the floor of the room. <laughs> no, it's not, but it really was. <laughs> So I was sad to have missed that, I have to say, because it, it's significant, because perforated plates, for those of you who don't know, these are really hallmarks of, of Kayenta folk making pottery. It's a pottery making tool, probably. Oh, yes. <laughs> so here, notice the little holes punched. This is the rim. Here's another rim. So notice these holes punched through. 
Um, I could flip back, but I'll just get confused. The whole thing is a big plate. I showed you one earlier with holes all around the outside. They're not drilled through, they're punched through when the clay's wet. Um, and they're very distinctive. Um, so there was no, no mistaking it. And so where we find these, we think we've got Kayenta folks, Kayenta potters living. Okay, so it was pretty exciting and I was very sad to have missed it. Um, just to show you some, some pie charts here, because it's really interesting to look at how the ceramics are distributed across the site. It really helps us figure out that these loci had different occupation histories. And so looking up here at Locus A, um, this big light colored area is Mugion Membrous ceramics, so quite a few of those. We've got um, it's a lot of polychromes as well, but a lot of different things. We've got White Mountain Redwares and Cibola Whitewares, which are more sort of northern types. We've got more southerly types like El Paso Polychrome. A um, lot of stuff at Locus A, which makes sense when it, because it does seem to be the, the largest, most continuous occupation at the site. Locus B is interesting. My colors didn't turn out too well here. Um, but what I wanted to, to point out is the Maverick Mountain Series ceramics, which is this. And the Maverick Mountain Series pottery, pottery like the perforated plates, is a, is a hallmark of Kayenta folks. And there are a lot more of them, those at Locust B than anywhere else at the site. Locust C is my favorite because it's pretty much all Salado polychrome. And it's mostly the late types. <clears throat> So just to show you these late types again, to remind you, um, things like Cliff, Polychrome, Dinwiddie, Tonto, Nine Mile. Um, these are all types that Patrick Lyons has recently um, tried to formalize and, and systematically look at their distributions. Um, so based on this, we think that Locus C was occupied late after Locus B, um, and at the same time as the latest occupation at Locus A. Okay, so that's three up. Um, we spent one season working exclusively at 3UP, and then uh, in 2009, we're able to um, go and work over at Thornholt and Gommelstad and just put in a couple of test units there. Um, and boy, Thornholt really piqued our interest. Um, the unique construction of the, the final occupation there uh, really drew our attention. It's on the ridge overlooking Tennessee Creek in this aerial here. You can see this is the southern room block and the northern room, room block. And notice this big depression in the middle, which I'll talk more about in a minute. <clears throat> um, in addition to this, there are pit house, probably pit house depressions all along this ridge that Roger Anion identified when he was out at the site. Um, so again, it looks like probably a pretty long occupation history. <clears throat> So this is Catherine's, again, Catherine's lovely map of Fornholt. This was the result of our rock by rock mapping and what of our two, two weeks of wall clearing. We had this very nice detoured map with um, a contour mapping as well. So you can see there's these two main room blocks, the southern and the northern. They're slab masonry. They're within a stone's throw of one another. Um, together, there's about 60 rooms. Um, we think the southern room block was about two stories high. Well, about. It either was or it wasn't. It <laughs> we think that portions of it were two stories high. Um, there's pretty good evidence for that. It's pretty tall and lots of rocks falling over. So it, in the southern one surrounds this, this large rectangular, oh, maybe I'll do that. This large rectangular thing that is quite depressed. Um, and we've debated about whether we're calling it a plaza or a kiva. I'll show you some comparisons of other, other similar things in a moment. Um, so right now it's called the plaza kiva. <laughs> That's its official name. Um, so these room blocks were built on top of an earlier membrous pueblo. And, and it looks like they probably took a lot of the stone from that pueblo to make the later pueblo. So just to get you a give you a sense of some of the wall constructions and the variability and all that. Um, and this is some of the results of our, our clearing. And here's, here's probably one of the best corners at the site. We've decided they did not know how to make corners. Um, this is actually from our test unit that shows a wall that's got some chinking material in it. So they'd use these big conglomerate stones and then they'd put smaller stones in. This one's interesting because of the, the row of upright cobbles 
Um, and there's actually two of them. And, and there's just a lot of variability in, in the wall construction there. But it's, it's masonry, as far as we can tell, there's no adobe at all. Okay. So, oh, and I also wanted to mention that many of the walls in the southern room block, uh, we notice they look like they're burned. Um, did I say southern? I meant to say northern. Yeah. Okay, so back to the Kiva Plaza. Um, here's another great aerial. Um, we're standing there inside of it just to get, give you a sense of we, we could, we, we're pretty sure we got its shape outlined pretty well and that, you know, this, whatever this is that comes out here, we couldn't find any walls that, that connected that. Um, there's definitely some walls along in here in it. And it looks like this part over here is probably uh, two stories. So here's a comparative example. This is from uh, <clears throat> the WS Ranch site, which is a Tularosa face Pueblo. So um, Tularosa face sites tend to be a little bit to the north and east of where we are. And this is the, the, great, the great Kiva with its entryway at WS Ranch. And there, there it is again. And so to us, this looks pretty similar. Um, there's also this um, at Foot, Foot Canyon Room, which is another uh, Tularosa phase site. It's up, I'm trying to remember how far, to the, to the north and west of where we are. Um, and it's actually got, they called it a plaza. It's this big rectangular room within the room block. Didn't have any features except for these, these post holes. And so I guess the jury's still out. Um, this is one of the questions we want to answer, unless Catherine wants to tell us right now what she thinks. But um, it's, a, it's a Kiva. It's a Kiva. There you go. <laughs> OK. So there's also another depression that we know nothing about, really, right here. We don't know if this is an additional Kiva. I believe it's. Um, Drawing the blank, Higgins Flat Pueblo is another Tularosa phase Pueblo that's up on the San Francisco or the Blue River, I can't remember, San Francisco River, and it's got a Kiva in between, in between the two, correct? I'm looking at Catherine. She knows more about this than me. And um, so we're thinking, well, it could be that or maybe a, a, a large pit house from the earlier occupation. So we're not sure. Okay. So unfortunately, I don't have any nice graphs of our ceramic assemblage from Fornholt, but, and these were not ceramics that we found at Fornholt. <laughs> um, but these are examples of the types that we do have, just to give you a sense of it. And so most of them are corrugated brown wares, um, uh, Tularosa fillet rim bowls, which are these lovely smudged bowls with a, with a fillet rim, hence the name. Um, St. John's polychrome, which is a white mountain redware type from further north. Uh, Tularosa and Pinedale black and white. Pinedale is important because um, it's a late Siebel or whiteware type. And um, El Paso polychrome, Pleias red in size. We had Pleias red in size, right? Yeah. What's missing from this picture? <laughs> no Maverick Mountain ceramics, no Salado ceramics, not a sherd. Um, despite the fact that it's not that far between <laughs> Fornholt and 3UP, even, you know, you think, you know, Something, but no, nothing. Okay. Okay, so what clues can we get from the, the pottery? A um, couple of things, site occupation dates. So three up, based on the ceramics that we have, and these have been cross-dated elsewhere in the Southwest with, with tree ring dates. So we, a lot of these we have some pretty good dates for. Unfortunately, the, a lot of the 1200s types do not have good uh, cross-dating, so it's a little more speculative. But we know we've got Mogollon occupation, classic members, uh, 1200s occupation, a mix of traditions, Maverick Mountain series pottery, so the Cayenta folks. We've also got White Mountain Red Wares and Cibola White Wares and um, ceramics more from the south. And then we've got a late Salado or Cliff phase occupation. Fornholt, we have Mogollon classic members. Again, a mixture of traditions in the 1200s, but it looks like a different mixture of traditions with the cons conspicuously absent Cayenta and nothing uh, Salado at all. Um, we do think there's the overlap there in the 1200s. We're pretty confident about that. Pinedale black and white um, goes till 1325, right, Barbara? And, so, and we've got several, it's more than just one shirt. We actually have several shirts of Pinedale black and white. So we're pretty sure that we've got that these folks were there at least partially at the same time. Okay, so not so beyond dating, we can also talk about cultural affiliation and regional ties. And I, I'm sort of repeating myself, but we think there was a Cayenta enclave at 3UP and then later Salado groups. We don't think they were Cayenta groups at Fornholt and they had stronger ties with Tularosa phase 
sites, um, groups, groups that lived in Tula Rosa Face sites to the north and to the west, and no Salado groups at Foreign Holt. Um, beyond these things, we can also learn quite a bit about um, production and circulation of pottery. And unfortunately, I don't have all the data for this yet, and I, I will soon. Um, but we're, we're doing um, NAA analysis on a large sample of pottery, including material from 3UP and Fornholt. And hopefully, we'll be able to source the clays and identify where different types of pottery bring, are being made. Um, here, that's me collecting clay near and, and temper, actually just below, 3UP is right up there. And there's actually a lot of sources. Susie t actually took me out and showed me a bunch of other sources that we, um, uh, I'm teaching a pottery class at um, CU Boulder right now, and I had the students play with the clays and fire them, and they actually refired very similar to a lot of the, the Maverick Mountain and Salado pottery and the utility wares that we have from, um, from 3UP in particular. Um, also looking at the temper, we have, have looked at um, quite a few samples of sand temper from 3UP uh, and Fornholt, and the sand that we're finding in the, in the sherds appears to be local. And so the utility wares, the Salado Polychrome, and a lot of the Maverick Mountain um, ceramics seem to have the same temper. Um, there are things there that are not local, like the White Mountain Red Wares and the Sea Below White Wares and things like that. So we, we think at least, based on what we know now, that, that there were probably Cayenta and Salado people there making Cayenta style and Salado style pottery using the same clays and tempers that they use for the utility wares. This is not one of our tempers, by the way, for those of you, <laughs> if anybody's familiar with petrographic, this is a, an example I borrowed from someone else, but just to show you what it looks like under a petrographic scope. Okay, so I wanted to turn to obsidian and also tell you what we've learned so far about obsidian because this was another one of the things that, that drew us there. Um, and again, obsidian analyses are in progress, but here's what we know so far. Um, there's obsidian all over the surface of these sites, um, more so I think at 3UP than at Fornholt, but certainly in our test units we have just tons of obsidian nodules um, that we have to sort out from everything else. So there's, there's obsidian nodules available right there. There's a lot in the various creeks. We collected this bucket. It's about a third of a bucket in about 20 minutes, um, just walking up and down the creek. So there's a lot. Um, at 3UP, about half of all the debitage is obsidian. From, which, uh, yes, obsidian. And um, for any of you who've worked at sites in the Southwest, you know that that's pretty unusual and it was very hard to convince our students <laughs> that it was unusual. So now we have a bunch of students out there who are going to be very disappointed <laughs> if their sites aren't covered with obsidian. Um, but um, just there's some differences between the loci um, at 3UP that I wanted to point out. And most significantly, so we did it a couple ways. We looked at percent obsidian by weight and percent by count of all the debitage. And regardless of how you look at it, Locus 3, which we think is the latest, has the most. Locus A is actually a little variable there, but um, the least. And then um, we have B, B and F both in here. It's sort of in between. Um, so we think what we're interpreting this as is that uh, at the 3UP site, obsidian use increased through time, through the 1200s and into the 1300s. Um, it, it peaked at the height of Salado polychrome production, which that's actually what we expected. Okay. What we didn't expect is how much obsidian they were using at Fornholt. Um, so here, I did throw Gommelstad in for, for comparison too. Here's 3UP A, 3UP C, and look at Fornholt. It has even more. Um, and that was sort of surprising, to me anyway. Um, so there, it appears that this group that was there in the 1200s at Fornholt was, was manufacturing even more obsidian tools. This is, so we're talking about the, the debris that's left over from making the tools, not the tools themselves. There are a lot of obsidian points, as you can expect from these sites as well. Nearly all of the projectile points are obsidian too. But this is something that, that I haven't had a chance to really explore what, what this could mean, but it, it appears that these folks at Fornholt were quite interested in obsidian as well. <coughs> Rob Jones has been sourcing obsidian from the Upper Gila and elsewhere as part of his dissertation research. And what he's found so far, and Rob, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like, not surprisingly, the material we've sourced from 3UP is it's all local. But it's not necessarily from the best quality source. 
which is a little surprising. And it's not necessarily from the closest exposure. To, um, there's various places where you can actually go to get the obsidian. And so that, that was sort of an unexpected uh, result. And Rob will probably figure out why that is in the next six months. Okay. Okay. So just, um, <clears throat> no, I don't want to go there yet. To summarize what we've learned so far, we think there are at least two waves of migration into the Mule Creek area, one that brought the Cayenta immigrants in the late 1200s and another that brought the Salado affiliated groups from southeastern Arizona after 1350. So evidence for the first wave, we have at three up site in the form of the Maverick Mountain Series pottery perforated plates. Um, the second migration, we also have evidence for at three up at Locust C. <clears throat> we think that um, the Salado groups probably joined folks that they had ties with there at three up and um, moved and moved in at least at three up they seem to have really focused on a, an area that was a little bit separate from the rest of the site. Um, but because we now have um, evidence for this sizable, we think, population in the 1200s at Fornholt, we don't think these migrants were moving into an empty frontier. Um, there were people there and they had to fit into the social landscape that was, that was there. And um, we don't know if this is true, if this is a, a unique for Mule Creek or if it's true of other areas as well. And that's, that's one of the things we want to we wanna think more about in our future research. So we can't help but speculate about the relationship between these two sites that are, are quite close to one another and, and the folks, the relationships between the two groups that were there um, in the 1200s. Um, there are some pretty striking differences between the two sites in the way they're, they're organized, and I think this really reflects some striking social differences as well. So just to reiterate, there's no adobe architecture at Fornholt. There is at 3UP, so people had different ideas about how things were to be built. Um, Fornholt seems more compact in the sense that it's, it's more tightly organized and around the large kiva, whereas 3UP, although it's hard to tell, it seems to have grown by accretion. There's no real evidence of public architecture, and um, it doesn't seem to be as, as formally laid out as Fornholt. Again, this suggests that the people, people in these two sites had different ideas about how their, their village was supposed to be organized. Um, again, Fornholt really seems to lack the Cayenta immigrants, um, and this suggests they, did, they didn't have much interaction with these folks, um, not even a single shirt from, from across the way. Um, and although the community at Fornholt ended by, you know, sometime in the early 1300s, the Three Ups community seems to have really flourished and prospered and continued on at least into the 1400s. Uh, and after that, we're not sure what happened to them. So um, we don't have the data to make a strong argument, but we think there's probably some tension between these folks. Um, and that one source of tension might have been access to the obsidian and not, not so much in the sense that they could have controlled access to it. I mean, you can, you can get obsidian pretty easily just by going out and walking from, from your site. However, they might, have been, they might have been in competition over trading partners. Um, and so that's where we think the, the tension may have been because a lot of the non-local ceramics, the 1200s types, um, are sh they, they're the same types at both sites. So they seem to have had the same long distance connections. And so there might have been some, some juggling for who had access to those trading partners. Um, the evidence for burning at Fornholt is intriguing and um, we can speculate wildly about what that, what that means, whether that means that the, the, the Pueblo burned. Um, we don't know under what, under what circumstances that was. We can't answer that question right now. Um, and we don't know. <clears throat> we don't know if that was a respectful act of closure or an act of violence. We don't know, but I, I hope that we will have some better evidence soon. <clears throat> so, um, over the next two summers, we're going to keep working out at the Fornholt site um, and answering some of these, the questions that have been brought up over the last couple of years um, from our work at Mill Creek and. As Bill talked about, we're going to be offering a preservation archaeology field school in collaboration with the University of Arizona. So we want to train students in field methods and emphasize this preservation-directed, conservation-minded research um, and understanding archaeology's place within uh, the communities where they're going to be living for, 
for five weeks this summer, <laughs> they'll get to know the community very well. Um, so another goal is to collect data um, from limited excavations at Fornholt to try and better understand its relationship to other sites in the Mule Creek area and other contemporaneous sites further north and west, and that's going to be Catherine's main dissertation topic. So she's going to be she's going to be our field director this summer, and she will be helping us guide our, our research strategy, um, coming up with our questions we want to answer about the Tularosa phase in Mule Creek. So I just want to conclude by saying um, we could not have done any of this without local support. The folks in Mule Creek are wonderful. Susie, who is here, I just want to give a special grateful acknowledgement to her and to Alex, who could not be here today. Um, this, you know, National Science Foundation funding is great, but if you have a community that supports your work and is interested in what you do and is, is feeds you goats and, <laughs> and lets you have fresh milk and, and, and a lovely field camp, it really makes a huge difference. And so I just wanted to conclude with that. Thanks. And I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Yes. Yeah, um, if I understood you correctly, there are two different migration areas. Either of them or both of them were they connected with Jeff Clark's you know, Jeff Clark's research on San Pedro? Yes. Well, do you, do you mean did the people come from the San Pedro, or do you mean <laughs> well, either from the San Pedro or from the north? And, and what about probably we what equivalent time period? So equivalent time. Yes, so the San Pedro, the, the migrant, you have migrant enclaves in the San, San Pedro in the late 1200s, right? And then you also have Salado sites as well. So we're, we're talking about the same basic time period comparing the two areas. Is that, is that, is that what you're asking, Don? Basically the same group. Probably. I mean, we can't say they're the same people, but they had the same larger identity. They shared the, the same larger affiliation. Yeah, we think. Right. And then you think that, or at least we're working on the question that we know that the San Pedro uh, went out, the lights went out in San Pedro, at least in terms of a lot of in their early 1400s or so, and playing with the idea that some of those groups on their way perhaps to Zuni or someplace else went through Mule Creek, and that would be sort of like that, that look of sea uh, at, uh, at the three up site, that little, little group that moved in there. Good, Hopefully, if we, if we find that um, with the, the compositional analysis of some of the pottery, we are looking at some, we're looking at some of the Safford sites um, further to the west. So we may, we may find that there are exchange ties between the areas, and that, that might help us bolster our argument. Yes? <coughs> Excuse me. Early on, you showed a map of the distribution of Mule um, Creek City. It looked like all of those sites were south of the Gila. I believe so. I would go back to the map. And then even more specifically, was that just generally that they ran south of the Gila, or did they not cross that? <laughs> you know, in a very specific sense. There we go. So there's a few. Um, so here's the, the Gila right here. Um, and then here, I don't know, Jeff, is this an artifact of, of sampling? Or is this real? I guess would be my question. This this area. Well, there's not a lot of sites. In yeah, that's. Kind of, uh, I think that's the main. <laughs> <laughs> well, back to the San Carlos is there too. Oh, San Carlos. So there's a lot of not a lot of sites we have, we know much about. <laughs> well, there's San Carlos. Yeah, there's six ones. Okay, Rob. Rob. I mean, that that big hole there, uh, in the area above the Gila, that appears that, that there there's no obsidian. That's uh, that hole is currently being filled in. Uh, in terms of sourcing by some of the work that I'm doing. So hopefully we'll know whether or not Mill Creek is moving up into those mountains and in the area or what it might be a grasshopper or whether that, uh, that boundary that you see between Mill Creek City and, and the northern San Francisco volcanics is yeah. real. Right now, I mean, you see that big blank spot on the map. That's full of people. We just don't know what, how much of the they're using and we don't know where they're getting it. Yeah, so it's really more of a sampling and a sourcing issue, not 
not a big pollution. That's the case there in the eastern part of the state. In the western part of the state, and especially the boundary there between Mule Creek and the Sacita Mountains and San Jacques sources, the green sources, that's a strong boundary. Oh, yeah, that, okay. That's yeah. that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of that, you know, that sort of big blind spot on the map, let me uh, let me get back to you about this. Okay. Well, and that's this this is topic. real as well. Yes. But that that the um, the Tierra Incognita is basically Tonto Basin. Uh, that no, no, Tonto that we have the eastern it's part or Circle of Tonto Basin. That I'm trying to. Where is it? Right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, that's Tonto Basin. Right. So this is San like, Oh, oh, right? I'm sorry. I was yeah. looking at the wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. That's Tonto okay. Basin. And you'll see a little Mule Creek up there. So. Yeah. There's a little. <laughs> <coughs> Does obsidian <coughs> outweigh other material types in tool? In Does the tool? It, I'm sorry, what? Does it? The obsidian mm -hmm. outweigh other material types such as chert, uh, in, in tool? Or, yes. yes. At, 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 in Mule Creek it does. Now, I, I don't know, maybe Jeff can comment on other areas, but certainly there it does. And I don't know, what about other upper Gila sites, Rob? Oh. The obsidian that we see is generally either in the form of projectile points or a lot of, there's a lot of, a tremendous amount of retouching on the yeah. obsidian plates there. Yeah. The other kinds of formal tools are generally being made out of locally available rhyolites and other sites. Right. Um, and that's because obsidian is only good for a couple cuts before it gets really dull. Yeah. And so if you're doing any kind of durability work, you need, you need a different kind of stuff. But yeah, I, I would say that. Uh, that of the formal tools, what we what we have recovered in Mule Creek is by and large of city and projected points. Mm -hmm. As you go west, of course, the city starts dropping off and the flakes are unstable. Yeah. By the time you get to the San Pedro, um, after 1300, I think the average is about three or four percent of the flakes don't assemblage. So that's still a hundred fold increase. Prior to when the impacts arrive, so pre cayenta it's like 0.01% or 0.1% somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. um, after 1300, it's between three and four percent. So that's a major increase. If you go to the enclave specifically at Davis Ranch and Reef, the cayenta enclave, it's up to 10% of the assembly. So that was, and it's all from the Creek. So that was one of our big hints that immigrants were in control of this um, city and exchange. And just for comparison, it literally is 50% uh, at 3 up and more. It's like 60% at 4 I don't remember, but it's a huge proportion. Yes, TJ. Has any of the archaeological survey in the Milwaukee area turned up Apache archaeology? Do you think that the Apaches and the Pueblo peoples overlapped at the end of the occupation in that area? There's not been a lot of systematic survey in that area. I am not aware of evidence of Apache occupation. Are you, Rob, in the, like in the forests or anywhere there, just north? Oh, that's right. There's the one. Yeah. One site that I haven't been able to go back to that's but right. I'm more knowledgeable than, uh, about Apache archaeology myself. But on the uh, in the vicinity of three up there is what looks to me uh, as uh, like a, a small Apache. The, the systematic survey in the Gila you know, Forest area, I don't think has, has recovered much. And you know, it's, it, the area is obviously famous for the historically known uh, Apache occupation. That is not translated into a strong archaeological That you, I think you've seen here in the <coughs> question and answer period that this is a team effort. And <laughs> Absolutely. We have, we have a whole group. I mean, our partnership with the University of Arizona has allowed this uh, great database to be uh, put together. Uh, a lot of this material is coming from previously uh, recorded sites in the past, and uh, within the office, there's all sorts of uh, it's an active dialogue that's going on on an ongoing basis, and it's a really exciting process of seeing research get done on uh, you know, 
know, day to day, week to week, month to month basis. Uh, all of this evolves. In, in a couple of years, we'll get Deb and, and the whole team back here, and you'll probably hear a very different story. Uh, <laughs> a lot more detail and uh, resolution of, of uh, some of these questions in ways that we didn't really expect. But this is really the exciting thing that's going on at the center right now is, is this process of, from Susie and, and Alex in the local community and the, the Gus who, and their uh, niece who uh, did the first work out there and, and brought us into the, the valley. It's just a really neat process to be part of. So uh, thank you, Deb, for uh, making this presentation today. But really, all of the folks uh, from the center are uh, deserve a hand here. Absolutely. Thank you.